Blessings this morning. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at several different parables of Jesus. These parables have offered insight into the ways in which we can live our lives, as well as how we can model our lives after Christ. And looking at these stories under a new light, I've noticed different things, and I've gained greater understanding in the messages that God is offering to me. Last week, we looked at the parable of the prodigal son. Today, we backtrack right before that parable in the Bible, and we look at two parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Like our parable last week, these parables are about the lost being found. Like our parable last week, they are important for us to remember. However, unlike that story from last week, the lost in this parable is something that we have maybe misplaced rather than something that misplaces themselves. In all three of these parables, joy comes in the return of that which was lost. Let's take some time this morning to think about things that in our lives that sometimes get lost and the joy that we feel when we're reconnected with those lost things. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty of this day and all that it promises. We thank you for life, we thank you for joy, and we thank you for every opportunity we have to walk with you. While people throughout time have been prone to wander away, let us remember that each of us is wrapped in your love and surrounded by your guidance. While we may look the same, inside we sometimes feel lost. Find us, Lord. And now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Psalm 14 describes humanity in its authentic and not so positive way. Unlike many other psalms, this one does not offer praise or petition to God, but rather tries to lead us to believe that there are no people who seek God. There are no people who do good things. Psalm 14 also offers us the opportunity to reflect on what reality really is, on what the nature of human reality really is. The culture and society that we live in is one that is quite skeptical about anything that they cannot touch, feel, smell, see, or hear. Too many folks rely on understanding that can only happen through the use of our senses or through the use of logical reasoning. However, Psalm 14 attempts to challenge the worldview. It attempts to offer a different view of reality than that which is universally understood and accepted. When the psalmist asserts that only those who are not wise, those who are foolish, deny God's existence, it's not an example of name-calling, insisting that those folks are just not smart, but rather the psalmist is describing the way of looking at the world and reality as not being in line with the way that God is ordered us to be. It's more accurately a case of the choices that we make, that people make, that are not good. The people themselves are still good, as I'm sure many parents have said to their kids from time to time. The psalmist reminds the reader that unfortunately it goes beyond the mistaken views of reality. Unfortunately, folks also make unkind, bad choices based upon those wrong assumptions. As we are all aware in this day and age, such foolishness and bad choices can even be found within the walls of our churches. Many things are wrongfully done under the umbrella of the church, under the umbrella of what people believe God is calling us to do. Ultimately, Christians may also act foolishly sometimes, denying God's existence by refusing to rely and trust in God in our decision-making and in our lives. One could see Psalm 14 as a ranting and a complaining poem, one without much hope for redemption, 
Thankfully, though, the psalmist does not allow that to happen. The psalmist brings God's perspective into the mix. The psalmist reminds us that the ever-present God is in our lives. God is indeed watching over all of us, seeking to find those who are doing the will of God. This all-seeing God concludes that all have turned aside and refused to do good. However, God is a loving and a grace-filled God. The psalmist ends this psalm of lament with a prayer that God send salvation in order to restore the hope and livelihood of the people. After all, it is when God saves and restores the people of the world that we can genuinely offer up our joy and our glad tidings. Much like this psalm, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin addresses that which has gone astray, that which has been separated from the amazing love and the amazing protection of God, as well as the joy that comes from being reunited. These parables and the one from last week follow a section of the gospel where Jesus is offering teachings of discipleship, how to follow Christ. These parables are Jesus' response to complaints by the religious leaders about Jesus' indiscriminate welcome to all people, sinners and saints alike. Jesus chooses as his examples for those, these parables two people with very limited resources, a male shepherd and a female with her dowry coins. For these parables are two people that some religious folks may have seen lowly and unworthy of God's love. For this shepherd, the sheep, is a precious resource for which the shepherd would be responsible to the owner if anything were to happen. And for this woman, the coin is a part of her limited resources. This dowry coin served as her only type of insurance if she were to ever find herself alone, a widow, or divorced. While some might view the leaving of the other sheep in order to search for the one lost sheep as being irresponsible, that is simply not the case. For that sheep, and likewise that one single lost coin, they both have great value to these people. Truly, the contagious contagious joy that they experience after finding those lost items is something to tell you how important and how valuable they are. And in that same exact way, the religious leaders are to understand that God rejoices when a sinner is welcomed back home into the community. Both of these parables share the same basic pattern. First, we get a main character. Second, that main character loses something that's important. Third, that main character searches frantically for that one lost item, almost to a point of ridiculousness. And fourth, once that thing is found, they have a celebration. And that is probably the most important part, the joy that comes from finding that which is lost. What can we learn from these stories? Jesus concludes each story by noting that the heavens rejoice far more with the repentance of one person, one person who has changed their life than all of the other righteous people who have lived their lives. Now, does that mean that the other 99 are not important? That is not what it means. It means that all are important, and it's important to not let go of the one person who is also important. God knows that we are all part of his family, that we are all children of God. God cares for each and every one of us deeply. God loves us all deeply. That is the key. As long as there is even just one lost, the other 99 are simply not complete. As long as one of our sisters or brothers is broken in this world, as long as one of them is cast aside or seen as irrelevant, as long as one of our sisters and brothers is called a sinner by the rest of us, then we are all at a loss. 
When any of this happens, God's heart is broken. God will never, ever stop reaching for the one because of God's love that is so great. Likewise, God's grace is more abundant and always there for the lost and for those who society sometimes deems unredeemable. Jesus tells these parables in response to the righteous leader's rejection of Jesus socializing with the downtrodden people. People of faith naturally don't want to be lumped together with these hypocrites for whom Jesus rebukes. We would much rather see ourselves as the recipients of the joy <clears throat> and celebration that come with being amongst the found. However, we should recognize that more often than not, we sometimes do belong to those supposed righteous rather than the presumed sinners of the world. When we complain about people who have appeared to cut in line or whom we believe have taken the easy way out, we echo the dismay of those Pharisees and scribes. When we belittle the undocumented foreigners for cheating the system and the poor for relying on government assistance, <clears throat> we hear these stories and we wonder how can we be like Christ when we don't love those. When we see expanding inequality amongst the people, creating the wealth, crediting the wealthy for their success and judging the poor as being incompetent or irresponsible, we too fall into these harmful and hurtful patterns. However, when we offer grace to the person who bumps us in line, because we don't know their story. We are living our lives more in line with God. Likewise, when we offer food or water or simply just a smile to those who may be struggling, we are paying attention to what God has called us to pay attention to. When we help our child find that prized position that they have lost more times than we would like to count, but are certain that their life is over without it, we are reminded that God would, do, would and does do that same thing for each and every one of us every single day. As is true for most of our lives, our response to the world may say much more about us than those whom society looks down upon. Truly, God's grace cares little for our reputation according to the worldly standards. Thankfully, God's grace changes us as it changes all of its recipients. Thankfully, God seeks us out when we are lost and values us as priceless and worthy of both the search and of the joy in the return. This week, our challenge is to try to see the world through God's point of view, through God's eyes. In doing so, how will our lives and our little corners of this world be different? God searches for the one who is lost, the one who is often forgotten, the one who the world often pushes out of sight. Should we not do the same? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the truth that you offer to us stay with us. May all that is lost in our lives be found through you. May we work together to heal the brokenness of this world and turn it into love and turn it into hope. And may we strive to ever be your faithful disciples in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen.